Good morning, good afternoon. A warm welcome to all our attendees today from across the globe. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on building your big data analytics strategy block by block. I'm Lisa Glenn, your host and presenter for today's session. Joining me today as expert speaker is Sanjay Sharma, Senior Big Data Architect from the Impetus Labs. Now, Sanjay is the driving force behind our big data projects and has established expertise in this domain. In this 40-minute session, we're going to be discussing the best practices and tenets of creating a successful big data strategy that will work for your particular big data issues. So let's go ahead and take a look at what today's session has in store for us. Big data is a big problem. But on the other hand, this colossal data is also a gold mine of valuable business insights. Analytics on big data is really changing the way in which technology is evolving, as well as bringing in lots of new challenges to deal with. In our session today, we're going to discuss the best practices of addressing big data analytics problems, building strategies to cope with these challenges, and choosing the right strategy with the optimal technology stack to address these problems. We're also going to share some real world examples with you. So let's just dive in and get started. As done with almost all the software strategies, the first step is to gather the requirements correctly so that the business problems can be thoroughly understood. Now, this implies that we identify and define what it is that needs to be done as well as lay down our expectations for the solution. The next step is to assess and select the right strategy. This step involves finding the right patterns and best practices to architect, design, and implement the correct solution. Now, another important step is to determine the right tool set and or technology set that would fulfill all the defined requirements as well as support the best practices. And the last step is to actually implement your chosen strategy and resolve your business problem at hand in, of course, a cost-effective manner. Now, as per our experience, one of the main issues that the data architects and stakeholders come across is the inability to ascertain, really, whether their problem is actually a big data problem or not. And unfortunately, there's no real defined volume limit or algorithm to help you determine that at exactly which point a data problem will eventually evolve into a big data problem. The usual trend is to simply define big data in terms of data volumes or sizes. However, a better way of classifying big data is by understanding the concept of the three Bs model, which is the variety, volume, and velocity of data. Let's start by understanding the easiest part, which is volume. Now, this is simply the data size that we're capturing and is measured in bytes of data. While in the past, gigabytes were supposed to be big, nowadays you hear terabytes, petabytes, or even exabytes in the context of big data. Now, variety means the different types and formats of data that we may capture. A really simple example of variety can be a social media website capturing data from its own site, as well as taking in inputs from Twitter or Facebook. They may also be using Google Analytics, as well as internally using data from other third-party sources. Now, all these combinations result in a number of data formats, which may vary from text to audio to video to databases to log files or to web services calls and so on. Now, under the last V, which stands for velocity of data, or the speed by which it's being captured. And let me use the same example to explain this. Say a feed from Twitter might have numerous tweets coming up for a particular user. On the other hand, the keyword-driven feeds 
can reach a viral status and might result in multiple thousands of tweets going out simultaneously. So when we're classifying a problem as a big data problem, we really need to consider all of the three factors in the 3D model, which again are velocity, volume, and variety. A simple issue of larger volume may not turn out to be a big data problem at all, but a moderate sized data problem may expand into a big data problem if the velocity and variety issues come into the picture. We're going to move on now and talk about the big data analytics life cycle. Every software product has a life cycle, and the same holds true for the big data as well. Now, the life cycle starts with the creation of data. And it can be created in multiple ways, as well as have multiple formats. Now, you can see on your screen the second step after creation would be ingestion, where the data may undergo complex transformations or filtering or even enrichment before it becomes suitable for the third stage, which is analytics. Now, Analytics may also call for some processing of data before it can under, be understood to derive valuable insights from it. Visualization is the final aspect of understanding analytics in the data and hence forms a very important step. Now, in every stage of the big data life cycle, there are underlying concerns and problems that need to be addressed. The data is usually created as part of external systems like RDBMS or server logs or audio video streams or even third-party data sources. These data volumes are huge. So in the creation phase, we need to address concerns such as how to store the data or whether we need to optimize and compress the data. We also need to monitor the data creation phase and make important decisions such as using cloud-like elasticity, data backup, and, dis and disaster recovery strategies. Now, the next phase, the ingestion phase, has its own set of challenges where the various transformations and integrations play a major role. The data warehousing industry has traditionally used ETL, or extract transformation load techniques, which cover most of the challenges related to the ingestion phase. Here, some of the key decisions that need to be made involve finding the right tools and technologies. And the same holds good for the analysis phase, too, and suitable tools and technology decisions need to be taken. This decision may involve addressing the classic build versus buy question and assessing how to reuse existing investments. In fact, we actually addressed this particular issue in one of our previous webinars that we did. And that recording is available under the webinar archive section of our website, impetus.com, if you'd like to go check that out. Moreover, the data may have did hidden business useful trends and traits, statistical data mining, machine learning and NLP, or natural language processing, that are becoming essential parts of the analytic, analytical phase these days. And the last and another very critical phase is the packaging or presentation of these analytics. And here again, tools and technologies play a pivotal role, and really standardization is one of the key requirements. Now, with so many new modes of data delivery available, the visualization for various channels also needs to be considered seriously. For example, it's more important to know whether a graph view would be a better depiction or would possibly a classical tabular report offer a better representation of a given problem. Similarly, mobile and other handhelds may require a completely different representation. So now that we've understood the three Bs, as well as laid down the foundation of big data analytics lifecycle, let's go ahead and find out how these combine together 
can be used to help us define and create a big data strategy. Now, one way is to create a matrix where we can capture straightforward questions related to volume, variety, and velocity of data against each phase of the big data life cycle. Now, these questions may be as simple as how much, what type, and at what rate. Now, if you can see on your screen coming up, you're going to be able to see a sample representation of such a matrix. So here we've captured all the three Vs against each phase of the big data life cycle. Now, once you fill up the relevant columns, you can actually use this matrix as a foundation to create a strategy that can really address your big data problem. So let's go ahead and move on, and I'd like to take you to the next part of our presentation, which is talking about selecting the right strategy apropos to your big data problem. Now, at Impetus, we've had the advantage of working with big data problems for many years now and have fashioned a master strategy that is able to address almost all the major big data issues and problems. We've actually been using this strategy successfully for many years, and we have lots of happy customers, and it really brings a failure-proof solution to your big data problem. I'd now like to ask Sanjay to explain this strategy a little bit more in detail for us. Sanjay? Thanks, Lisa, and hello to our webinar audience. I'll share with you the details of our big data analytical strategy that has been proven itself to be successful and effective time and again. Let me bring your attention to the screen where we can see all the big data lifecycle phases as well as a high level solution fulfilling the various phases of this life cycle. Before we proceed further, let us discuss what are the key requirements expected from an ideal solution? An ideal big data, big data analytics solution should have the ability to easily support large data, which can be terabytes or petabytes. The system, ideally, should also be distributed across geographically unaware processes. It should enable quick response to highly complex queries as well as support of a wide variety of data types, including images and arbitrary data types. So the ideal analytical solution should be able to provide the data scientist with all the necessary tools so as to empower him to explain the significance of data in a way that can be easily understood by others. Your analytical solution should have the ability to incorporate machine learning, providing recommendations, and executing analytics on real-time incoming data, such as logs, as well as providing domain-specific canned reports. It should also be able to handle data from heterogeneous data sources, whether structured or unstructured, while also providing a high rate for loading and analysis as well as the ability to handle software or hardware failures. So we believe that a high-level strategy involves creating a platform or a solution covering all the aspects of the big data life cycle, as well as managing the three Bs, variety, volume, and velocity of data. Ideal solution for the strategy can be a platform that allows different kinds of data to be ingested. One of the ways of implementing such a solution is to utilize service-oriented architecture or SOA in form of an extensible character-based mechanism. This character mechanism then can allow new connectors to be added or modified and thus allow few kinds of data sources to be catered to efficiently, thus enabling a future-proof solution. Another requirement which is gradually gaining importance is the real-time analytics. So the ideal solution should also facilitate complex real-time processing and transformation 
because the data is actually used for complex analytics. Complex event processing and rule in integration is a related requirement and can be used to solve a variety of real world problems. Hence, our ideal solution should also provide complex event processing support. The analytical phase should allow easy ways for data modeling and transformations that can allow data scientists to derive the maximum value. So, the solution should provide user-friendly interfaces for data modeling as well as offer easy to use configurable workflow management interfaces. And of course, interaction with existing visualization tools completes the entire life cycle. So the solution should allow easy integration with visualization tools which not only allow analytical data to be understood easily but also provide deeper insights into even sparse or complex data sets. Thanks, Sanjay. To create this ideal big data analytics strategy, you need to handpick the tools and technology for the most optimum results. Let's discuss creating a framework that uses a leading open source solution, Apache Hadoop, for solving big data problems. Hadoop has certainly come a long way from its humble early origin. It was initially introduced as just a simple file system in the Apache Nutch project, a massive web crawler which needed a file system to store larger volumes of data across the internet. On your screen now, you can see some components of the Hadoop Cosmos, which are an integral part of the Hadoop ecosystem. These tools and components are aligned with the big data lifecycle and serve different purposes for creation, ingestion, analytics, and visualization. Now, Scroop, Flume, or Chukwa allow the users to procure the data to be ingested into a Hadoop-based data warehouse. The ingestion and analytical phases may utilize Hive, Pig, or programmatic processing or workflow systems like Uzi for data transformation and enrichment. Now, to cover up the advanced data analytics requirements in the analytics phase, Apache Mahout can be used for a wide range of machine learning and data mining algorithms, such as clustering, classification, collaborative filtering, and frequent pattern mining. Now, currently, Hadoop is the leader in the open source big data technology world. However, there are many other products and initiatives both commercial and open source, foraying into this space. And let's go ahead and talk about some of these. Now, there are attempts, and as a matter of fact, even some success in running Hadoop or similar distributed processing technologies faster and also at real-time processing support. MapR, DataRush, HStreaming, HPCC, platform computing, data stacks, et cetera, are just some of the examples of faster or alternative technologies to Apache Hadoop. Now, of course, major database and data warehouse vendors like Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, HP, and EMC, et cetera, have also jumped on that big data bandwagon and have really come up with their own custom solutions, which are usually categorized as MPP, or Massively Parallel Processing Databases. NoSQL is another important big data technology. And while some call NoSQL as No to SQL, we would actually prefer calling it not only SQL, due to the fact that slowly but surely, the gap between regular RDBMS and the NoSQL world is reducing. There are other options, such as graph databases, like Neo4j and others that you can see listed on your screen now, which can really help you address big issues coming up as part of the ever-exploding social media data. 
There's also faster versions of SQL databases, such as VoltDB, which actually bring together the capabilities of RDBMS ACID with the power of big data. Hardware or appliance-based solutions also can offer alternative solutions for those big data problems. So now that we have the strategy, tools, and technologies in place, I want to go ahead and ask Sanjay to discuss how we can put all these elements together. Sure, Lisa. We'll now deep dive into the various strategies of using Hadoop as a big data analytics solution. As explained earlier, Hadoop is a great big data technology and is slowly becoming the de facto leader in open source big data world. My primary focus in this discussion will be on the analytical and visualization phases since, since there are multiple ways in which we can use or combine the power of Hadoop for these important phases in the big data life cycle. If you have a look on your screen, this approach we are using Hadoop for cleaning or transforming the data into a structured form and then loading the same into the RDBMS database. So here, we are using Hadoop capabilities to handle ingestion and some part of the analytical phases. On the other hand, some analytical processing is handled at the RDBMS level as a data sync. We can now use an existing visualization technique or tool from the rich world of RDBMS visualization products. Hadoop can efficiently access the data between the RDBMS data sources and Hadoop systems through DB input format and DB output format interfaces. Once the affected data is processed, it can be then pushed to an RDBMS database which can subsequently act as a data source for any BI solution. This approach provides the end user with the flexibility of parallel processing of Hadoop and an easy to use SQL interface at the summarized data level. It is pretty good when the summarized data is not too big a problem to pose a challenge for the RDBMS databases being used. The solution is not very expensive, but there are fewer options. This approach is also suitable for the high-touch queries, where the user wants to perform real-time ad hoc analytics, as most of the RDBMS databases come with a comprehensive set of performance enhancement techniques. However, when the summarized data is very large, this approach might fail to deliver. Also. If batch analysis is the key requirement, then moving data to an RDBMS database could be a redundant activity. So Sanjay, what would happen if you plan to apply analytics directly over a Hadoop system without moving it to any RDBMS databases? A good question, Lisa. It can prove to be a very effective practice to analyze the data directly from the Hadoop file system. Let me explain this with the, with the help of an example. Say we have a scenario where the process and summarized data, which in itself is very huge, is placed on the Hadoop system. So what do we do in a situation where we want to use the summarized data for batch reporting without getting into the complications of moving the data out of the Hadoop system either to an MPP data warehouse or RDBMS. This can be done by using Hive as an interface to the data present on Hadoop systems. Hive provides a very promising interface for executing SQL-like queries by converting them into MapReduce jobs. These properties jobs are executed on the Hadoop clusters for the data that is itself present on Hadoop. 
This can be further explained with the help of the diagram that you can now see on your screen. This approach allows you to do batch and asynchronous analytics over the same data present in the Hadoop system. This is a very cost-effective approach as it does not involve any extensive managing separate data sources other than your existing Hadoop system. It also provides you with the flexibility of scaling to any level with your summarized data. Today, a lot of options are available in the market that allows integration of MPP data warehouses with Hadoop. This is worth considering if you have large amount of data, even after applying summarization over it. Using Hadoop for cleaning, transforming the data into a structured form allows you to load the data into any of the available options of MPP data warehouses. When the data is being uploaded, you may actually write user-defined functions to perform database-level analytics and then integrate the same with BI solutions using ODBC or JDBC connectivity for end-user analytics and reporting. Also, using MPP data warehouses will allow you to use various performance enhancement techniques like index compression, metalized views, result set caching, IO sharing. Alternatively, uh, some of the MPP data warehouses may also provide you with a good framework that supports MapReduce job executions within their own clusters at MPP levels is providing you with a second level of parallel processing. This feature is really good for working with high-touch queries and also provides an excellent framework for end-user ad hoc analytics. However, the disadvantage of using this approach could be the cost involved in this. Most of the MPP data warehouses are expensive to acquire and some also require high-end servers for deployment, which could be a costly proposition. Using this approach also calls for an expert team that has a hands-on experience on MPP data warehouse management and development. This again could turn out to be a challenge in itself in today's rapidly changing technology space where open source technologies like Hadoop are getting widely accepted and adopted. Great. Thanks, Sanjay, for that great detailed explanation. We're now going to move on, and I want to tell you about a case study where I'm going to share with you how we helped one of our clients in developing an effective big data strategy. Now, I'm going to focus on big data analytics on live streaming social media data and using it to solve very generic business problems, such as understanding the customer sentiments, analyzing customer behavior, and taking proactive action and basically ensuring that customer satisfaction is monitored continuously across all channels, including social media. Now, this business problem involved performing a deeper analytics to find hidden traits and trends in the customer's feeds, as well as categorizing and classifying customer base for better offer management. Now, the high-level approach used in solving this problem involved addressing basic questions, such as how much, what type, and what rate. Now, as I shared with you earlier in the presentation, we need to put across these questions in the appropriate stage of the life cycle in order to correctly identify the right strategy and tool. After capturing and understanding the various parameters and concerns, we recommended that our client use HBase, Hive, and the house based solutions to serve the need of the deeper data analytics. We used Impetus proprietary big data platform, Iladap, in order to do this. Iladap is our realization of the big data analytics strategy that we just shared with you. And it's a complete big data platform which uses Hadoop and its ecosystem to provide the capabilities required to solve all concerns in the various stages of that big data lifecycle. 
Now, one of the important parameters that we had to capture as a part of the matrix is the rate at which these feeds from Twitter, Facebook, and other sources are getting ingested in the analytical system. And similarly, the volumes of the data being captured were also really important during the ingestion phase. Now, since the data feeds range from XML sources to JSON formats, that third V, which is variety, really came into the picture. Although in this scenario that I'm talking about, it's not as complex as it might be in some other cases involving image or video data. Interestingly, as true with traditional data warehouse world, the data volumes may increase or decrease during this analytical phase. Now, since one of the business requirements here involved utilizing classification and clustering algorithms, data had to be transformed into different formats compliant with machine learning algorithms. Now, this resulted in data volumes increasing during analytical phases. Classification and clustering algorithms internally also use various transformations, such as conversions to vectors, or term frequency formats, thus increasing the data volume significantly during this algorithm, this analytical algorithmic execution. Some of the important parameters that impact the visualization phase are the category and volumes of the analytical results consumed by the end sources. Now, for this particular case study that we're discussing now, one particular reporting requirement was visualizing the unknown patterns or topics as groups through a web-based interface for domain specialists to derive and identify any hidden trends and patterns within these social feeds. We had to run canopy clustering on the textual data to find out the optimum number of clusters. And then we had to summarize and keep the data prepared say, for the top 10 keywords within each group. So this specific business reporting scenario did not require data volume for storing the results. However, a different use case involved generating recommendations for identifiable end users on the product website, and this did require data to be prepared and kept ready for just fast ingestion by the website itself. Hence, the data volumes as well as ingestion rates for the visualization phase really became an important consideration for this reporting use case. Now, let's go ahead and talk about the technical approach for solving this problem after capturing and understanding the various parameters and concerns. And Sanjay, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about how we address this problem for our clients. Surely, the, the diagram that you can see now on your screen shows a high-level view of the Big Data Analytics platform customized for short social media analytics. Towards the left part, what you can see now are the various data sources, including the social media platforms and Web 2.0 enabled websites. Historical bulk data lying around in existing systems, including RDBMS or ERP systems, etc., can also be pulled in using appropriate connectors for them. In the next column, what we have are the connectors that enable converting the data from all kind of data sources into a Hadoop-based data warehouse. Hive, or big Latin like interfaces, can now be used to manage complex ETL flows as well as analytical processing. After collecting this data, Apache Mahavat can be used to categorize the data and store it as per categories for later use. Mahavat can also be used to run classification algorithms to help, say, perform sentiment analysis or tweets or social updates or blogs. We could, of course, also run market use jobs that use NLTK or natural, natural language processing toolkit to perform 
natural language processing of the comments and feedback from the social data sources. Now, this aptly massaged and categorized data can be used to draw graphs and analyze market sentiment about the product. The data can also be used for MIS and to compile regulatory reports that need to be produced on a regular, regular basis using SCOOP. Since the platform is powered by Hadoop, therefore it can linearly scale to thousands of nodes using commodity hardware. This plays a significant cost advantage in the long run, especially when Hadoop also allows deployments on cloud infrastructure. As far as failover and resilience is concerned, Hadoop has been built from ground up to cater to high durability and availability requirements and alleviates a lot of issues related to networking and machine failures. We also know that it is important for businesses to track down and take advantage of opportunities quickly. This platform may enable you to react to the events as they happen. Thanks, Sanjay. That was really informative. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to reiterate some of the key learnings and takeaways of today's session. So summing it up, one can start by creating a matrix which can help to capture the questions related to volume, variety, and velocity of data against each phase of the big data life cycle. An ideal big data strategy would lead you to create a platform or a solution that covers all the aspects of the big data life cycle as well as be able to manage these three Vs. Organizations are using the Hadoop ecosystem or possibly a blend of alternative technology, alternate technologies including FOSS and commercial technologies such as NoSQL, Data Rush, HStreaming, etc., to address these problems. We also discussed the three strategies of using Hadoop as the big data analytics solution. The first option that we discussed is indirect analytics over Hadoop, which provides the end user with the flexibility of parallel processing of Hadoop and a SQL interface at the summarized data level. This solution is not very expensive, especially compared to some other options out there. Now the second option we discussed was direct analytics over Hadoop, which allows you to perform batch and asynchronous analytics over the same data present over the Hadoop system. It's also a very cost-effective approach as it doesn't involve any expense in managing the separate data sources. And finally, the third option was integrating MPP DWs with Hadoop when you have a large amount of data. Now, this is a more expensive option vis-a-vis -vis the other two that we discussed. In fact, Impetus has successfully used the Hadoop ecosystem to create a comprehensive big data platform that actually provides the capabilities required to solve all concerns in the various stages of big data lifecycle. Now, it looks as though we've actually started to receive some of those questions from you, the audience, and I'd just like to remind you now that you can use that chat panel on the right to ask any question you might have. But before I take up those audience queries, I'd just like to take a moment and introduce Impetus Technologies. Impetus is a leading technology and R&D services provider with a strong focus and established thought leadership in the area of large data analytics and high performance computing. We have built top-tier expertise and offer consulting and professional services in technologies like Hadoop, numerous NoSQL DBs including Cassandra, MongoDB, Membase, and a range of commercial MPP products and ETL BI analytics tools. Our expertise spans the domains of large data management, cloud computing, data analytic, analytics, mobile SaaS testing, social media, web technologies, performance engineering, open source, among others. Okay, so now it's time to address some of those questions that you've submitted. 
And it looks like the first question that came through for Sanjay is looks like someone would like to know if industry standard reporting tools can be integrated with Hadoop solutions and ILADAP. So Sanjay, what do you think? I think uh, most of the leading reporting and analytical tools now have the capabilities to integrate with Hadoop solutions. Uh, for example, MicroStrategy or Pentaho or JasperSoft or Intellicus uh, can actually support analytics over Hadoop using Hive, ODBC or JDBC interfaces. However, an important thing to note here is that for the traditional analytical or reporting tools often rely on in-memory manipulation of data such as in-memory cubes the same is quite impossible in the big data world. Hence, uh, any analytical or reporting tool should rely on Hadoop, MapReduce execution processing, then using in-memory analytics, and just use the tool's visualization cap capabilities, until unless, of course, the data is already summarized for in-memory handling. OK, great answer, Sanjay. Someone else writes in and says, one of the challenges that we are faced with is to evaluate which use case represents the best consideration for understanding Hadoop integration into our business. Which MPP, et cetera, and what can Impetus do to help this? Sanjay? Sure. So, uh, Impetus has been helping a lot of organizations finding out what kind of tools and technologies would fit in best for the kind of uh, business problem. Uh, and uh, our experience has shown that usually a specific tool or a technology would fit in a very specific use case. So the first step, uh, the first step that we usually suggest to our customers is to do a proof of concept to find out if a given tool set or a technology would actually be the right solution for the given business problem or not. Even in the case of MPPs, uh, since the, uh, the, uh, there are too many players in the MPP world uh, right now, there again, there might be specific use cases which will fit in a specific MPP, while there might be scenarios where MPPs would not fit in or might not be the best cost-effective solution, and you might want to utilize either NoSQL databases or expand extend uh, or expand or extend RDBS capabilities over that. Okay. Thanks, Sanjay. Okay. It looks like someone else asked the question, how can you enable analytics of data being managed as part of SAP or ERP or legacy solutions using Hadoop? Sanjay? Uh, good question, Lisa. So, most of the legacy systems or uh, uh, or ERP systems like uh, uh, SAP and uh, and other uh, systems usually have some ways of exporting data from these systems onto uh, onto the other systems and Hadoop can utilize those capabilities such as say a REST based interface or a, a log file import into the Hadoop system. Once the data is present in Hadoop or, uh, or any MPP, it can be used for analytical purposes and the data can be created at par with the other data sources available in the data platform itself. Okay. Great questions. Someone else wrote in and said, you talked about an ideal solution having real-time capabilities. What kind of real-time capabilities does ILADAP support? Sanjay? 
Okay, so uh, LADP actually supports uh, real-time search over data uh, during the inflow of data in the pl platform itself. However, uh, the search uh, would again be limited either by time range or data volumes. For example, uh, we can enable real-time search on data for the last 24 hours for an online shopping site on a rolling basis. We could also build in a counter service uh, just to cater to requirements such as number of hits, say for a, a specific page or a video or, or a specific entity or a product. Also, uh, we can uh, support real-time classifications such as those required for sentiment analysis, so for example, for tweets. All right. And another person asks, uh, can you platform run on cloud infrastructure, and does it use any specific Hadoop distribution? What do you think? Yeah, yeah certainly. So uh, Hadoop actually can run on uh, virtual software, and uh, I think that's related to one of the other questions that we have, which is related to uh, whether we had any success creating Hadoop clusters on series of virtual machines. So, uh, as such, uh, Hadoop is able to run on cloud infrastructure, and cloud, uh, as in IAS or infrastructure as a service, cloud. So, Amazon Web Services is a uh, is an IAS, and uh, uh, we have been running uh, our LDP platform for various customers on Amazon Web Cloud itself. Uh, we have been able to run it on Terramark or Rexpace. And uh, same would hold good true for our private clouds as well. Uh, and uh, interestingly, even Microsoft Azure is uh, planning support for Hadoop. And I'm sure the larger times platform should be able to use that as well for uh, as the underlying uh, solution. For, for the platform itself. Uh, but but uh, one uh, a bit of caution over here. So Hadoop uh, does not like running on virtualized machines, and uh, we should we usually recommend running it on in-house dedicated machines rather than using virtualization because virtualizations, of course, always have some kind of overhead. All right. It looks like, unfortunately, that's all the time we have to answer the questions live. But we are going to be addressing all the remaining questions that we received through email. And some of those questions include, um, what techniques do you suggest for mapping the answers from the matrix to, those, to the most suitable solutions, tools, and technologies? And another question that we're going to answer through email will be, what type of training is available in the market Place to train existing staff on Hadoop, Hive, etc. Not really looking for a response on Java, JSON, or the more common languages or frameworks. Again, great questions from our audience today. And I'd just like to thank you all for your time. And we really hope that this discussion was a learning experience for everyone and will add value to your big data initiatives. Now, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email us at inquiry at impetus.com or you can visit our website, bigdata.impetus.com. And before we go, I'd also just like to inform you that we will be sponsoring and having an exhibit at the TDWI World Conference in Las Vegas. Please write to us if you'd like to meet us there. Once again, thank you so much for joining us in this session today. Goodbye.